No room at this inn. Is that the government's message to child refugees after they reversed the House of Lords amendment on unaccompanied children joining their families in this country? We ask stars from showbiz and parliamentarians what can be done to continue the campaign for the child refugees. Watch the Alex Salmon Show on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, where we return to a subject which provided one of the crunch votes of Theresa May's minority government, the plight of unaccompanied child refugees seeking to join family members in this country. In 2017, when the House of Lords held enormous sway and the House of Commons was finally balanced, the issue of unaccompanied child refugees was brought to the centre of the Brexit debate. Lord Dubbs himself brought to this country as a child refugee from Nazi Germany, seized the opportunity to propose an amendment to the May Withdrawal Bill, which the May government were then forced to accept. As I arrived in this country in the summer of 1939 as an unaccompanied child refugee. In fact, this country at the time offered safety to some 10,000 children. And it is thanks to Sir Nicky Winton, who helped to organize kinder transports from Czechoslovakia, that I got here at all, and I almost certainly owe my life to him. Once in a while, there are major challenges to test our humanitarianism. And Europe's refugee crisis is surely one such challenge. But within that, there is, I believe, a need to do something about unaccompanied child refugees in Europe. I'd like other children to be offered safety in this country and be given the same welcome and opportunities that I had. How things have changed. When the House of Lords similarly amended the Johnson Withdrawal Bill, the government used its newfound House of Commons muscle last month to overturn it without any ceremony. Uh, turning, Mr Speaker, to Lords Amendment 4, uh, which was moved in the other place in the name of the Noble Lord, Lord Dubbs. While the government humbly disagrees with the Noble Lord's Amendment, this amendment in no way affects our commitment to seeking an agreement with the EU. Primary legislation cannot deliver the best outcomes for these children as it cannot guarantee that we reach an agreement and that is why this is ultimately a matter which must be negotiated with the EU and the government is committed to doing uh, to seeking the best possible outcome in those negotiations good way and of course to you. however while the amendment was removed from the bill the issue itself has not gone away and today we speak to some of the committed campaigners within and without parliament who intend to bring it back to the political centre stage. Yeah, I think the more of us, the better. And we will, definitely. I will get every celebrity and every face that I can onto this campaign. I will do anything to make it happen. We need to make it work. An adult refugee in the United Kingdom can take their children with them, but a child refugee can't take their adult parents or siblings with them. And I think that's a great inequity because surely the children where refugees deserve the same rights as adults or refugees. And I don't think it's been fully thought through the consequences of not doing that at all. Uh, and spurious arguments were made up against it, which are shown not to be true. With the parliamentary prospects looking much less hopeful for the child refugee campaigners, thoughts are now turning to how to renew pressure from outside parliament. One aspect is to focus on the contribution that the descendants of child refugees of the past have made to this country. Alex speaks to the star of a thousand TV programmes, Debbie Arnold, whose mother was brought to this country as a toddler on kinder transport. Debbie Arnold, welcome back to the Alex oh, Arvin Show. It's lovely to see you, Alex. I feel, I feel like I'm part of the furniture here. Well, the last time we spoke to you, I mean, you've been on what, a thousand uh, programmes <laughs> or more in, the, in our television screens, but we, we spoke to you about housing and the homeless, but, but you've got a very particular interest in taking up the cudgels on behalf of uh, child refugees. Cudgels you're taking up with the formidable Lord Dubbs, of course. Yes, my lovely Alf Dubbs. Well, my mother was on the kinder transport, and so was Alf Dubbs, and so I'm, I'm trying my best to uh, get the word out and make things now that, of course, now that the government has, well, 
What have they done? The, the Lords said that they were going to carry on this amendment and then the, it went into the Commons and they said we weren't. So uh, what happens now? Well, the government's position, as we just heard from Stephen Barclay, the Brexit Secretary, is that, OK, it doesn't have to be in the legislation in order for it to be government policy to help uh, child refugees. Why have you got doubts about that? Well, I mean, because beforehand, when it was legislation, it still wasn't done. And so, and then they had to go to court to say, you know, this is not being done. So, and then it, and then, of course, now it's not part of the legislation. So I don't really kind of w understand what the government's talking about. But there again, I don't most of the time. So, uh, so what you're saying is that if the government didn't honour its commitment, that was the previous government, the yeah, previous exactly. government, when it was in the legislation, how can you trust them when it's not in the, in in the, the legislation? legislation. But why wouldn't uh, a government want to help? I mean, these are, we're talking here about child refugees uh, who uh, don't have any immediate uh, family with them in Europe, uh, but have family in the UK. Would a government really want to not to facilitate the entry of these people? Obviously not. And I, and I don't understand how. I mean, my mother came over here. Alf Dubs came on the Kinder Transport as well. I mean, and they didn't have any relatives over here. And they had to be sponsored to come here. And that's what, you know, 10,000 kids came over here. And then, even then, the government didn't want to do it. But it was public opinion. So now we need public opinion to change. But how do we change that? If public opinion was so strong, I'm sure they'd listen to it. But people don't understand the difference between immigrants and refugees and there is a massive difference but what you're saying that it's way back because everybody in this country says oh yes look at the kinder transport program that's a, a sign of the open-hearted yeah. generosity of uh, of this country are you saying it wasn't an unambiguous policy no, it back wasn't. in they the didn't want late to do 1930s it. well you know they didn't want to do it but the but the public opinion swayed and they said they had to do it. after crystal Nath, they said that's it we've got to do something and they did now tell us a bit about, about your, your mum. I mean, she, she was a small child when she was on Kinder Yeah, you know, she was, you know, came over here at four years old and she was put on the train. And a lot of people don't know either that they were told that if they cried, when, when the parents took them to the station, they were told that if they cried or showed any emotion, they weren't allowed to put the kids on the train. So you can imagine it was like a silent thing and they were saying goodbye to the children. And, and the children, little children four years old, how could they understand what was happening? I mean, it's, a, it's a, such a sad and horrible thing, but there again, they came over to England, they saved their lives, and I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for the kinder transport. But tell me, did, did, did your mum sort of sit you down one day when you were old enough to, to understand and say, this is how I came to this No, country? she didn't. She, you know, it was always part of my life, always was, where it wasn't part of anybody else's life. I remember when I was little growing up and seeing, you know, films of Auschwitz, and my mother used to run to the TV set and say, oh, perhaps I can see my mummy and daddy, and it really used to make me so upset. So I never was very interested. It used to just upset me. The whole thing about the war, I'd never want to talk about it because it upset her so much. Generations of uh, people who came as part of that programme, uh, it must have been massive contributions. Uh, I mean, I mean in, you, in your world of acting, I mean, uh, have you come across other actors who, who were part oh, or had relations that's in That's quite the interesting. Programme? I think people didn't really talk about it. It's only recently now that I know so many people that are connected, now that I'm friendly with Alf Dubs, you've got... Um, Dame Shirley, I mean, she's, she, she's very high up in, in autism. There are thousands. In fact, there's a, there's a list of people who came over on the Kinter Transport, that, you know, top um, physicians, top, you know, people, in surgeons, everything, people who've saved lives constantly. And there are people now, when we went to the, uh, there was a, a Kinter Transport reunion, and it was just fantastic to, to see, I mean, the people now that who came over are very old, but they're, they're children and what they've given to society and how we've changed this country because this country saved my mother's life and I feel that all the contributions that she made and all the people that came over on the Kinder Maid have made a huge difference to this country. So we've paid back our dues. It's perhaps something that the, the Learning Centre attached to the new Holocaust Memorial will, will do to show the contribution of, they, they of those should, who were saved. They should do. I think that would be fantastic. So why then, given that track record, I mean, let's talk about Lord Dubbs for a second. I, mean, yeah. I would pretty respect because of his background, because he was part of the programme, because he speaks with unrivaled authority on, on the issue. Where does he see the, 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 the politics of this lag and how is your campaign going to take shape as you mobilise public opinion? Well, I don't know. Me and Alf... They're going to be formidable together. No, I, I, no, I love, I love to work with him. At the moment, I'm not working with him. I'm just, you know, being a spokesperson for how I feel. I'm not. My views are my own, not his, as you say on Twitter. But uh, 
I don't know what's going to happen next. Obviously, Alf will come up with a plan and I shall be behind him. But we've got to help. We've got to get public opinion behind us. If we cannot get the government behind us, we've got to get public opinion. And somehow, we will, I'm sure. And, and as part of your campaign, will we be mobilising some of your your showbiz pals to, to get the message across? Yes, absolutely. I think the more of us, the better. And we will, definitely. I will get every celebrity and every face that I can onto this campaign. I will do anything to make it happen. We need to make it work. In the terms of the contribution, I mean, you're saying that people don't always appreciate the difference between uh, immigration and refugees. How do you illustrate that without downgrading immigration, which in itself many would argue, I would argue, is a thoroughly good thing for the Yes, I, I think immigration is good, but I think people think that people come over here as immigrants and they take from our society. They take from the NHS, they take from this, they get free this and they get free that, they get, you know, benefits. Whereas that's what they feel they come over. I'm not saying they do that, but I think that's what they think. Well, I think in terms of National Health Service, <laughs> the equation would be very much the other way around. Well, well, exactly. But that's what people think. And I think, on the other hand, with refugees, these people need help. They're not coming over here to, to, to take or even contribute particularly. They just need to be saved. They just need someone to look after them. They are vulnerable. We look after animals, and I am a huge you know, animal lover. We look after our animals so well now, because we have to. We get in animals from all over the world, from Greece. We have programs with Greece and Spain bringing in rescue dogs, but we can't bring in rescue children. And yet there have been moments, haven't there, in the last few years, one thinks of the autumn of 2015, where the the picture of Alain Kurd, the, the, the young Kurdish lad, I think three years old, lying dead on that beach, you know, mobilised, changed public opinion, and not just in this country, but, but worldwide. How do you create that intimacy with people without, you know, always having to rely on a, a picture of a complete and utter individual tragedy? I think you need someone to explain. I think people need to know. It's just about knowledge. I mean, beforehand, we used to just leave animals, didn't we? We didn't treat them very well. And I think now that because we've had so much public opinion that everybody loves, you know, like Paul O'Grady for the love of dogs, we have all these wonderful programs. We need probably more media on that, lovely programs, to show how lives have been changed. We need to do something very special to show this compassionate country there be a, a programme on successful refugees yes. and the contribution they've made. Exactly. <laughs> Did you know that? Yes, I think that you're absolutely right. And no one's done that. We need to know. We need to know the success of these people, but we need to help people. We need to feel compassionate towards these little children, some of whom are sleeping in the fields on their own. They have no family. Well, if anyone could put forward a, a programme idea and get it onto our screens, then undoubtedly right, you can. Right, that's the next thing. And that's the next thing. So, so lastly, in your own career, what's, what's your main activities at the present? Well, I still do, I do lots of voiceovers. I'm also a producer of uh, shows on cruise ships, which is great, which I actually produce and put on myself. And I'm also a contributor to Glowtime magazine. So I'm doing loads and loads of things. So I, I never stop. My, my career goes in one thing and out of the other. But I, think, I still think I might like to go back to a soap. But you'll keep coming back and joining us now, Alex. I Alex. love coming here, so thank you for having me. Great pleasure. Thank Thanks, you. Alex. Join us after the break, where Alex will ask prominent parliamentary campaigner Angus Brendan McNeil how MPs can still make a difference facing a large government majority. We'll see you then. Welcome back. Two years ago, while Lord Dubbs led the campaign for child refugees in the House of Lords, Angus Brendan McNeill, the MP for Nihilin and Year, led the campaign in the House of Commons. His private member bill sailed through its second reading in 2018 with all party support, only for the government to use procedural tactics to frustrate it from becoming law. Alex speaks to Angus McNeill about how to make progress in the new political environment of a government with a massive Commons majority. And I'm joined by someone who's taken key parliamentary initiatives in the House of Commons on the issue of refugees, Angus McNeill, newly re-elected as chair of the International Trade Committee. Congratulations, Angus. Thank you very much, Alec. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. It's an interesting role, particularly at this time, with uh, Boris seeming to learn international trade on the hoof. Every time we turn on the television, he thinks that Australia's WTO is a deal. Now, on the subject of refugees, in the last parliament, you produced the 
the family reunification, refugees family reunification bill, which Correct, yeah. sailed through its uh, second reading, a great achievement for a private member's bill, but then got bogged down by the government, lost in the, the sands of Commons procedure. What happened to that bill? Yeah, they wouldn't give it, it was technically called a money resolution, so I couldn't get it up to committee upstairs in the Commons. Uh, and there was a Tory whip was particularly difficult with that, and when Andy Ledson was leader of the House, um, I asked several times at um, business questions uh, why the money resolution wasn't forthcoming, and I was sort of stonewalling. Uh, three, four weeks on the trot, I asked uh, the same question effectively uh, to the leader of the House, Andy Ledson at the time, and there was really no will uh, within uh, the Tory party to move that on. I mean, we were only giving children the same rights as adults, something that's normal across decent countries across the world. Well, let's deal with the procedure first. I mean, for people watching around the world. So here was a, a bill where on a Friday, which most MPs have already shuttled back to their constituencies, was, was carried with a, a commanding majority. Absolutely. With a, you know, large number of MPs uh, uh, attending. But even with that parliamentary assent, uh, the government, uh, the black arts of, of government, uh, Whips and procedure managed to bog it down in the House of Commons. Uh, how, did, how did that make you feel? Well, that's very well summarised, and it, it, it really was difficult because I'd met uh, some of the young refugees in question who had hoped at the second reading stage that that meant that perhaps his sister might not be taking a dangerous journey through the Sahara, could just fly here in safety. If you go with people traffickers through the Sahara, particularly as a woman, uh, well, we don't need to spell out graphically what might happen. It's certainly not pleasant. Uh, and if you fall off a, one of the vehicles, then you're just left. And so it's a dangerous journey, both physically and mentally in many ways, uh, to try and get yourself to a place of safety. So and what you're trying to do was to get uh, children uh, and, and families reunited. These are people who, who have families already in the United Kingdom who were seeking to, to join them from danger zones and war zones as refugees from from around the continent. That, that was the objective of your bill. Absolutely, and it happens in other European countries where a child, more typically a teenager, might arrive in a certain jurisdiction. Uh, the family have been split up for one reason or another. They might have wandered ac across Africa or the Middle East or whatever and ended up in a European country to relative safety. In normal countries, they allow uh, children to have the same right that adult refugees have. An adult refugee in the United Kingdom can take their children with them, but a child refugee can't take their adult parents or siblings with them. And I think that's a great iniquity because surely the children who are refugees deserve the same rights as adults who are refugees. And I don't think it's been fully thought through the consequences of not doing that at all. Uh, and spurious arguments were made up against it, which are shown not to be true. So what is the government's logic here? I mean, I mean remember, memorably, Alf Dobbs in the, in the House of Lords succeeded in an amendment to Theresa May's uh, Brexit bill. Uh, has tried the same thing and succeeded in the Lords with Boris Johnson's withdrawal bill, but he used his big majority in January to overturn that in the House of Commons. But what is the government's motivation? I mean, at most we're talking about, what, a few thousand uh, people involved? Well, why are they so dead set against a statutory provision to entitle these children to rejoin their families? Well, I'd say I would answer two things to, 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 to that question. Um, I think there's an ingrained uh, behaviour and motivation in, in, in the Home Office, uh, which is, and it's gone back to the end of the Second World War, where orphan children of the Holocaust, there was resistance to take them to Windermere, for instance. There were 300 children out of, out of uh, Czechoslovakia. There was resistance in the Home Office to allow them a sense of normality after the horrors they'd gone through in the Holocaust. So there's that strand that runs through the Home Office for decades. But I think more worryingly, perhaps, uh, in the current Conservative government is just uh, a feeling that they might get bad headlines from trashy tabloids who might say they're taking in too many people and that I think is such a, a baseless and unthought through uh, motivation, a knee-jerk motivation that it really is sickening uh, when you put that against what children have had to face uh, in becoming a refugee, the uprooting of their families, the dismemberment of their families, the killing in some cases of members of the families or the, or the death threats to other members of their families. Let me ask you about your constituents in the Hilly Rania, the, the Western Islands, the Hebrides. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any feeling when you were fortunate enough to get a prime position in the, in the private member's ballot that perhaps uh, the member should have been proposing something a bit more directly related to the, to the Western Islands as opposed to the, the issue of child refugees? Did you have any 
blowback from your constituency that perhaps you should be minding your own fireside? Well, there's always one or two siren voice, but the overwhelming majority, 90 plus percent, I would say, uh, were, were on side with this. I mean, in the Hebrides in particular, unlike the near independent Faroe Islands with the population growing in the Hebrides, we see depopulation. Uh, and we want people. In fact, there were when some Syrian refugees, I think a quarter of all the Syrian refugees to the United Kingdom have come to Scotland, and some went to the island of Lewis, and the other other five or six islands were complaining that they didn't get any refugees. Uh, refugees tend to mean uh, a new spark, new initiatives, filling up schools, vi vitality in the community, people you'll get to know quite quickly. Uh, so no, to answer your question, there wasn't blowback. So it was you quite the opposite. When a society has uh, experienced the, the hard side of emigration, they are more uh, willing to see the, the benefits of immigration. That is absolutely right. And also they understand from their cousins and friends who are uh, immigrants to other places and have been welcomed in other places that when migrants or immigrants come towards you, then they should be welcomed in the same spirit that your cousins and friends and family were welcomed in other parts of the world. Now, what are the prospects uh, for this parliament with the massive Tory majority in the House of Commons? We've got Lord Dubbs still active, still campaigning in the House of Lords. Is there anything you can do in the Commons to keep this issue alive? Well, sadly, in the current uh, draw of private members' bills, nobody has taken up the baton. I was hoping somebody would take up the baton. So we will f find parliamentary devices, bills behind the chair or whatever. Uh, a bill behind the chair? What, what, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it's not much of a device compared to the private members' bill, but at least we can present it in the House and stick it behind the chair of the, of the Speaker. I will get some traction, some motion with that. We're doing some work with the NGOs as well. So what you're saying is you, you get, uh, although you don't get the same opportunities as being lucky in the ballot for Correct. a private member's bill, you don't get guaranteed time. You can still get your, your bill printed. You can still use the, ex you can use the parliamentary mechanism as to amplify the, the, the public campaign. You sound like a questioner with some experience of these, of these uh, methods. Absolutely, and, 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 that's, and that's what it's about. So it's, it's about keeping this in the public consciousness. I don't think, given Boris Johnson's huge majority, it'll be much in Boris Johnson's conscience, unfortunately, uh, or the Tory government's conscience. Who knows? They might have a change of heart at some, at some point, but they aren't going to reach any road to Damascus unless we try and at least work with the NGOs to keep this to, to the fore, because it's a normal thing in normal countries. And to resist giving child refugees the same rights as adult refugees. I mean, if, if they were even stripping, and I'm not advocating this, if they're stripping the rights of adult refugees, at least there'd be some form of equity treating ch ch adults and children badly. But treating children only badly is surely reprehensible and surely they're going to have a change of heart. And are you going to take a, a deputation of some of these families in to see Boris Johnson to see if you can get that change of heart, see if you can appeal to his better nature? I think every device that is possible, that we, that we can play at the heartstrings and play the, at the reality of the situation towards the Prime Minister uh, should be considered, and all other members of the government, particularly in the Home Office and the, and the, in, in the Immigration uh, Minister as well, because if we don't, this will wither in the vine. So we have to find things over the next uh, few years, hopefully perhaps in the next parliamentary year, uh, somebody who comes out of the of the hat for the private members bill mm -hmm. if I'm lucky enough to be one myself And if this hasn't been sorted by then I would obviously uh, Grab the button again and run with it one thing's always interested me and that's uh, uh, Would be a collection of uh, of the generations uh, Who've achieved so much who were the beneficiaries of of refugee programs and the kin I mean, the wonderful Debbie Arnold with a spectacular show business and soap career is is one of your your key supporters and, uh, and campaigners. But an example of all those in national life who are only here and only achieve what they achieved because someone at some point decided to rescue them from Nazi Germany or from, or from other extraordinarily difficult circumstances internationally. Is there, is there a, a, an argument for getting a, an assembly of, of these great achievers who've contributed so much and say these people would not be part of the, the fabric of the country unless somebody had said, you know, suffer the little children and let them come in? Absolutely. I mean, I think there's also the looking behind as to why that happens. I think when people come into a different society, whether we go to another society or they come to our society, we see things through different eyes and can see different perspectives and different opportunities. I'm reminded, as you've been speaking, about a, a man from the island of Lewis who helped uh, people uh, from a boat from Vietnam during the height of the Vietnamese boat people, and he got them to Hong Kong. He left his own merchant ship and helped them get to Hong Kong. Uh, these people later settled in Canada 
and uh, having left Vietnam with nothing, with roughly the, clo roughly the clothes on their back, uh, some of them are now multi-millionaires, if not more, in Canada. And he's welcomed it, uh, refugee reconvenience at various times in Canada. He's been over to see the people who left destitute or now beyond wealthy in Canada in a matter of a few short decades. So wherever refugees seem to go, uh, I don't have any academic evidence for this, but it seems to be they anecdotally outperform is it the experience of being a refugee, whatever, uh, they certainly enrich the societies they're in, help the societies they're in. We're lucky to have refugees, and we should think of it that way, the benefits refugees bring us, not what we're doing for refugees for the short period that they're getting on their feet. What would you, as chair of the International Trade Committee, say to him about the issue of child refugees? If you had your, your, your minute with the Prime Minister, appealing to his better nature, what would your message to Boris Johnson be? Well, today's refugees are tomorrow's trade partners and the countries they come from will be an invaluable bridge. Don't spurn anybody, be they refugees or be they potential trade partners. Uh, there is benefit, mutual benefits from us all to embrace both. Angus Brown and McNeil, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. When the opposition parties agreed to the Christmas election, the SNP's Angus McNeil described it as a parliamentary Christmas present for Boris. How right he was. The implications of a Tory landslide go far beyond the immediate politics of Brexit and impact on many issues where the opposition held sway in the minority parliament. Similarly, the House of Lords has moved from a commanding position to being emasculated. Key amendments to Brexit or anything else can now be summarily overturned in the Commons. Thus, the campaigners for legislative protection for unaccompanied child refugees will need to find new ways of progressing their campaign. The focus will no longer be on crunch parliamentary votes, but on the longer job of persuasion of public opinion. However, feelings remain strong and the government would be unwise to underestimate the impact of publicity and on how the public can be touched by the plight of refugee children. In politics, parliamentary majorities are what counts for much, but not quite for everything. Meanwhile, from Alex, myself and the rest of the team, it's goodbye for now and we'll see you next week. <laughs>